everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. Today's a very special video, um, very dear and close to my heart. It is the top five perfume bottle designs ever made. Now, mind you, I'm going to be quite specific here. The uh, perfume bottles I will be touching base on, or in particular this selection, is part of an ongoing effort that I'm making in bringing back splash bottles uh, not just splash bottle but not just splash bottles but also the concept and the art of pure perfumes preserving them keeping them alive now there will be also other concentrations in this video this will be focused on the best bottles the best bottle design and also uh, i might be making if this video goes well and if you like it i could also make other videos just to select best auto toilet spray bottles designed uh, best pure perfume bottles designed eau de parfum, and all you know all that jazz but this is going to be a little bit of a mix the only uh, common denominator is going to be that all of these bottles are splash bottles and i am using this gray very neutral background because the bottles have to speak for themselves and they they are so potent in themselves that they need a neutral background before we go any further, I would like to also note that on Patreon, this video will also present a special extra exclusive bottle, which will not be shown on YouTube. And I would like to also take this opportunity to thank all my fellow patrons for helping sustain the channel. Without you, it wouldn't all be possible. So stay tuned at the end of this video, uh, the continuation for uh, the video on Patreon will showcase a special extra bottle. Let's get straight to it. Uh, one note still to say before we get into the bottles now everybody has their opinion everybody's going to either you know everybody's going to say what their favorite bottles are there is a criteria that i followed uh, in in my selection and that being said i of course pure perfumes and splash bottles have been really artistic complex intricate and very elaborate and difficult to make prior to, you know, two centuries ago, uh, by now. So, Lalique, Guerlain, all of those complex, luxurious bottles with the silk tassels and um, Baccarat crystal uh, containers with hand-painted details and ornaments, that's all really beautiful, but that was not the criteria that I used to select the bottles. Why? Because all of those bottles have a very speci time-specific need to show the amount of money one has and, and luxury and opulence and how difficult it is to produce something. That's all good and fine. And there could be a video made on historic bottles as well. But in this video, I'm focusing on bottles that have changed, well, that have analyzed from a pop cultural point of view in particular, uh, and also before pop culture, but bottles that have changed our times, that have changed our way of seeing bottles and the design and the artistry that goes behind designing them and especially the double the dualities of uh the meaning behind the bottles what they look like and what they in reality mean and this is something that has happened from the 20s onwards not before and so that innovation and and that uh whimsical but also ingenious way of confronting design and having different layers to explaining it is the major factor that contributed to my choosing these particular five perfumes. Okay, let's get straight to it. Of course, let's get the biggest one out of the way. 1921 sees the release of Chanel number no. five. This one is almost empty and really dusty inside uh, the, the liquid because it kind of gets dirty with time. So 1921, Ernest Beau with Chanel, and Ernest Beau kind of launched, well, Chanel launches the perfume, but Ernest Beau is the perfumer behind it. This is not the bottle that used to be back then. Let's fade it in uh, on the side. So you could see it there, and um, it looks like something quite different than what we have now. What does this mean? This means that 1921, Chanel first wanted simplicity. Up until that point, bottles were super complex, complicated. Again, we're mentioning Lalique, we're mentioning Guerlain, we're mentioning all those complicated baroque shapes, twists and twirls and crystals and blown glass and colors and enamels. Really, really 
uh, peacocks of bottles, really. Uh, she went the opposite direction. The first bottle looked like a, you could say, and this is something that's alleged, people have been alleging that uh, she chose that kind of almost flask type of pocket flask for alcohol bottle because it is said that uh, she was really inspired by the flask that Boy Capel always used to wear. And also, she was very much inspired by the apothecary type of pharmaceutical glass containers of liquids, of medications and, and, and scents or raw materials for the scents. So there's that story uh, behind the first bottle. However, the first bottle from 1921 was, uh, by 1924, replaced by this type of bottle because uh, the very, very delicate rounded edges, corners, upper corners, bottles that were in production for, from the first batches of Chanel Number no. 5 resulted in really big complications when it came to shipping them across the world, whoever was ordering them, because they were very fragile and they would break very easily. Initially, those flask bottles were only on sale in Chanel boutiques, and later on, distribution found its way worldwide, and that's when these bottles kicked in, and this is when the Wertheimers took over and they re- formulated Chanel number no. 5, toned it down from 187 to like 83 to 87 ingredients. So that's a story for another time, but you could also check out the review of Chanel number no. 5, the pure perfume, in the cart section up there. Also, uh, follow the link in the description box underneath this video. I've made many videos on Chanel number no. 5 where I touch base on the history of it. So what has changed throughout the years? This shape remained more or less the same. The stopper changed. This is a quite thick one. This is a late 90s, early 2000s. And I also have the latest uh, bottle. As you can see, also the Les Exclusives are released in the same bottle as Chanel Number no. 5. But you could see what has changed now. They have sleekened a little bit this um, the stopper. It's become a little bit thinner, a bit more proportionate. In the 70s and 80s, the stopper was even thicker than you see it here. So it, it there is still some evolution happening. You see how, how this one is uh narrower than than the one than its predecessor. I think you can see it quite well. So this was uh just chronologically, I'm not saying that this is the best one, the my preferred one, but this is definitely in the top five. Now we're moving into the 70s. 1977 sees the release of Opium, the pure perfume. Now, this uh, particular little detail, metal detail here, is a bit more modern. It came out in the 10s, uh, I think 2017 or 16. There was a more rounded, oriental-looking uh, metal bit here before, but the version that we find today has this uh, rendition, a bit more simplistic, puristic connection to the tassel. However, everything else has remained exactly the same as in 1977. So the Yves Saint Laurent Opium, the perfumer behind this one is Jean-Louis, uh, I would say Suzak and Jean Amic. Hope I didn't butcher the name. And then we have a very famous designer for the bottle. And this is where we start understanding the duplicity of, of certain elements and details. Uh, the bottle designer is Pierre uh, Dinan. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Now, you know, it's he's one of those people that if you don't really look for him, you don't know that he exists. But Pierre Dinan, uh, what he did just to name a few other bottles that this gentleman has designed in his life, Eau Sauvage, not the Sauvage, but Eau Sauvage, Armani bottle, the 1982 one, Isatis by Givenchy, Obsession, Calvin Klein, Rive Gauche, Yves Saint Laurent, Fendi, the first Fendi bottle, Eternity by Calvin Klein, Liz Claiborne, Moschino's first 1987 fragrance, Obsession for Men. I mean, these are all bottle designs that he made, but in 1977, it was turned for opium to hit the market. And this is an incredible little bottle because it is inspired by the Indro. These are like small Japanese uh, lacquered cases that were worn under kimonos and held perfumes, herbs, and medicines in, in them. And so this is kind of inspired by the Indro. It protects the plastic container with its kind of lacquered brown 
tendon to red color, which was only used for the pure perfume. The Eau de Toilette has a more brown hue. Uh, so it's a container that has a glass bottle inside, which you cannot access, you cannot detach it because you have, the bottle is actually, the container of the bottle has this arch, this piece of plastic, and then the underneath one here, and they kind of click together once you place the glass bottle inside. And what is fascinating to note, we don't have the proper lighting now, but inside, underneath this glass, uh, it states that it is made in France as well. So every element of this bottle is made in France. The plastic outer container as well as the glass bottle inside, stopper as well. The stopper also has a duality. What we see here as in considered an oriental fragrance, but then opium, which was a huge political thing in China in particular, but then we mix it with uh, the Japanese uh, design of the of the Indro, and then we have the Netsuke, the Netsuke which would be little tiny, usually made out of wood lacquered creatures like animals with two holes on two sides through which the, the little uh, cord would go through. And they would also be tied at the bottom of, of these Indro bottles or containers. So this is something that um, Pierre Dinant really designed and went through and studied to implement all of these details of past of other civilizations and other cultures into a quintessential pop product, really, because this bottle in itself completely uh, represents pop of that era, 1977 in particular. This is definitely one uh, for the history books. Now, the pure perfume of opium is no longer in production, I believe, because the last batches that I purchased were produced in 2017. Um, every time I check the French Yves Saint Laurent website, it tells me that it's out of stock. So I don't know if they will be producing new batches. I really hope they, they will. But I have been stocking up whenever I find them, I, I purchase them because I, I can't live without my pure perfume of opium. You could check out the review of opium, the pure perfume, uh, in the card section up above. Also follow the link in the description box down below. The third fragrance is also probably uh, not a, a big surprise because I, I've said many a time how much I love this uh, bottle design and it is poison. Christian Dior's Poison. This is also a, this is the old version, the old design of the bottle uh, with the stopper. And you can see you lift it and then you have, this one still has a lot of liquid inside so we got to be careful. It's glass stopper. Now, 1985, the release of Poison or Poison. Esprit de Parfum. Um, the perfumer behind this one is Edouard Fléchier. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. You know, to get to this design, to this bottle, to this perfume, Dior was already in the 80s huge in Europe with their perfumes and their presence, but they were really low on the list of bestsellers in America. And they worked over five years to try to bridge that gap and to gain potent presence on the American market. So even though this one was launched in 1985, already in 1983, Dior licensed the name Poison. And so you can imagine how much they were already working on it. Dior has tested over 800 scents created by independent perfumers until they finally found Poison, until they finally smelled something that uh, would blow everybody's minds away and boy did poison deliver but this video is about bottles so what happens with this bottle a lot of work and a lot of research went into the bottle as well and to be able to explain it better to you i'm going to show you some really really special special extras here now poison is a poison right it poisons you it kills you so how does the bottle uh how should the bottle look like? We have to combine pop culture, fairy tales, and a very technical concept of poison containers, poison bottles. What does this mean? 
If we look at the esprit de parfum, the first thing that comes to mind is an apple, and it is the forbidden fruit. It could also be, from a Disney point of view, because in the 30s we have all seen, well, we haven't. I wasn't born yet, but everybody knows Snow, Disney Snow White. Obviously, Disney did not invent Snow White. Snow White already existed as a fairy tale before. But the poisoned apple is a big symbol, also biblical big symbol, of Eve eating the forbidden fruit. And Snow White also takes a bite of the forbidden fruit and dies. So this is a poisoned apple now, but only in the esprit de parfum form. What we're going to see here has a different shape. But what else is so typical to this bottle are these claws, these claw-like ribs. Um, raised ribs. These are called raised ribs on glass bottles. What does this mean? This means that actually eh, we're talking past, past centuries. By the mid-19th century, for example, in many European countries, in Great Britain in particular, uh, there was a big concern by the government because in the pharmacies, people would be, I mean, poisons were more accessible back then than they are today. And there was huge mistakes happening. There was a lot of illiteracy. A lot of people didn't know how to read, how to write. And people would dose certain medicines in a wrong way. People would poison themselves in so many different ways. Uh, arsenic, which is a highly toxic poison, was, was used to, 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 uh, to create green paint. And it was used also to uh, create wallpaper, to paint wallpaper, to create kind of like a, a very beautiful, intense green color of wallpaper. Oh, look at that. Isn't it interesting that we have that particular green used here? That's a reference. And uh, so mid-19th century... What happened was the British government took action against over-poisoning. So what they did was, because of the illiterate people, they would create glass bottles that would have very, very strong colors. They would be purple. This is a very dark purple. This is more of a fashion version of a purple. But we're talking more luminescent purples and greens and blues. So that people would see by the color, immediately would be alarmed and would know that there's a poison in that bottle. But what happens when one doesn't have electricity, when there's no light. At night, in the dark, you have to be able to identify a poison bottle. And that's why the bottles containing poison back then were structured with elevated, with raised ribs. So that even if you were blind and you were to touch the bottle, you would feel the ribs and you would know immediately, oh, okay, this, this bottle contains poison. And this is what the Christian Dior design team implemented in designing the poison bottle for the perfume. So we have that kind of biblical connotation of the forbidden fruit of the apple, but then we also have the practical element of a bottle containing poison and it having its elevated raised ribs to uh, tell you that it is in fact a poison. Now, what do we have here? This is a very, very special, super rare thing. It is a concentration of poison that uh, is very rare. It is an eau de cologne in light version. There were two types of eau de cologne. There was the eau de cologne and the eau de cologne light. <laughs> this was the light version. And as you can see in the back, it even tells us, back in the day it used to tell us, 93.5% alcohol. This is a 50 ml splash bottle. Now the first release of poison was eau de toilette, shortly after the Esprit de Parfum came out. But this was the, the first bottle. It was more flat and then elevated. So reminiscent less of an apple, as is this one, but nevertheless, very, very uh, telling of, of, of poison, of how a bottle that contains poison would have these elevated ribs on, uh, on them. And um, because this is an eau de cologne light, the glass is also lighter, so we can, it's much more transparent. It's a lighter texture of this velvety violet purple color. It's so beautiful, and uh, it just the way light refracts through it is just amazing. And again, with this lighter version, we get closer to the actual color of, po of bottles containing poison back in the day, mid-19th century. We also have... This, this little bottle did not make the cut as best bottles, uh, best perfume bottle ever made, plus it's a sprayer, except 
I'm going to mention it here because it comes with its own little funnel from Dior. And uh, when the light texture of the Cologne light is empty, you actually pull the sprayer out, you twist this open, and then you, you're supposed to pour this into here. So, uh, but already back then, both of them came full. Uh, when you purchase this set, the little, how big is the 7.5 ml Eau de Cologne light was already full. And you had your little funnel with you that you could use, and then you could refill it with this one. This one has never been opened, by the way. This is brand new and still sealed. I've never used this one. I have to mention one more thing when I'm talking about poison bottles. And this one in particular shows you how incredible this poison family is in terms of design. And it also shows you what a terrible, terrible mistake Christian Dior, the brand, has made in butchering uh, poison and deleting all of these products and um, basically reducing it to the new designed bottle, which is terrible when compared to the beauty and the elegance of the roundedness of this one. Um, this particular product is a holy grail in, in the poison collection in anybody's collection really. So again, we have this beautiful green, arsenic green moiré print. Moiré is a type of usually silk uh, that is woven in a way that it looks like it's watery and, and wet. Something used very much in, in Venice, for example. This piece here is the Esprit de Parfum concentration and it is the poison, Christian Dior poison bracelet. And yes, this is a bottle. This is how amazing Dior used to be, you guys. I mean, now we, we've lost, we've lost it. We've lost Dior somewhere along the line. So I'm not going to open this, it's super fragile now after so many years, but this particular side of the bracelet opens up just like this stopper, it's here. You lift it and inside here is poison, is the liquid, is the Esprit de Parfum. Of poison. How beautiful is this? I can put it on. The bracelet. There you go. When it comes to uh, Christian Dior's poison, I would say this is the best piece ever, ever made. You could definitely, you know, go to uh, an event and then just open this and then pour the poison into the drink and then poison somebody. So basically, again, the uh, the genius of of how to play with perfume and how to style it and at the end of the day also how to market it to to the the fans or whoever's wearing it and just creating these beautiful beautiful pieces this is uh definitely uh, together with uh, with this one um and let's get the other one out as well together you know the three of them in their three original shapes uh these are definitely definitely in the in the top five list of uh of best perfume bottles ever made i mean and i'm saying this again dior i shame on you dior for really for just discontinuing this beautiful tradition and heritage and uh as of late delivering just really lame releases for the most part um the last amazing release was uh, under hedy sliman's uh fashion direction I mean, he only designed the bottles, but anyway, uh, the three first Privé, uh, Bois bon, uh, bon Noir, bon Noir Chanel, Eau Noir, Bois d'Argent, and um, Cologne Blanche. So those were my last kind of, uh, well, together with the first Dior Homme, which came a bit after after they were released. But anyway, those were the the last historical moments of, of Dior, in my, in my opinion. Uh, okay. So moving on to the next one. Now the next one, uh, you'll be surprised <laughs> because it's unexpected in many ways. Uh, I'm gonna leave the bracelet on for now, why not? Hopefully it's not gonna leak. This one, I think nobody's expecting it. And, but it is so beautiful and it is a splash bottle, super rare, not in production anymore, unfortunately. It is cheap and chic by Moschino. The Eau de Toilette 
and this square box. This is how the font used to be. It was so beautiful. Again, Moschino has changed that. They don't have this kind of handwritten, cheap and chic design. The perfume uh, was launched in 1995, so that was a year after Franco Moschino died. But I do believe that Franco Moschino nevertheless smelled at least cheap and chic or was there for the initial phases or stages of, of its um, production. I would hope. I'm not so sure. Because unfortunately, Franco passed away just uh, a year before this one was launched. And it's so funny because the ad campaign showcases olive oil arriving to this big room where Popeye is dead. And she then screams and smashes this glass coffin he's in. And, and, and she kind of finds this perfume which she sprays on herself and that gives him back life. And it was kind of a way of also the desire of bringing Franco Moschino back to life. Uh, really sad, but I love that commercial, but it makes me sad to see it every time. Anyway, so this is how the box looks like. Look how much effort they put into creating these double-sided walls, and then it's all green on the inside, the Italian flag colors. And then we have the, the black container, um, and then gold and red. Typical uh, Moschino colors. This is the beauty of, of how the design for Moschino used to be. And But where's the bottle? Well, here's the bottle. It is adorable. It is a chubby little olive oil. Now, we're all used to seeing the the elongated version, which right now I did not take out here because uh, the elongated versions I have all have the new writing, but I do have this to show you the elongated version of what used to be. And you see, even the names were amazing. It was called uh, Milk of Irony or Irony Milk. The Ironic Milk. This is a body lotion. So it's called the Ironic Lotion. And um, so you open it up and you have this nozzle and uh, extra kind of pusher here. Pump for what is the Irony uh, Milk. And this is the same shape for the... Uh, slightly different it's like red black and white but this is the eau de toilette bottle shape as well however look at this beautiful font i mean this is so elegant and this is supposed to be olive oil's hair it's really really gorgeous so that was just to show you uh, the bottle that most people know today slightly altered but this one is very rare and it is my favorite it is uh, the rounded version splash bottle of olive oil with a golden head and a little heart on top because you can see here the heart is her collar and then down here you see you have the beautiful uh, cheap and chic font with the Moschino logo so this is a gorgeous gorgeous bottle very simple very round very playful but because it you know because it's because it plays with um, also the concept of not having to be skinny and an olive oil that's all of a sudden chubby it's just such a beautiful contrast and I think the sense of being able to laugh about yourself and not taking yourself too seriously is the genius behind Moschino in general, but it's also the genius in particular behind this bottle, the little chubby olive oil uh, bottle. And then you turn her head loose, and there you have the liquid in there. Mm. Right, it bobbled up a little. Let's put it on. I'm going to put quite a little drop here. I'm going to review. You know, Euro Italia is the manufacturer of uh, Cheap and Chic was back then, as you can see here, Euro Italia. Euro Italia, who also used to make the first Dolce Gabbana, man and woman. And Euro Italia also still uh, makes uh, Versace fragrances. But So Euro Italia still produces uh, Cheap and Chic. And the, one of the reasons why I love it, and I will be reviewing also the newer formulation, which is should be more or less still the same, uh, I love it so much because it's one of those rare perfumes that has an overdose of my favorite flower. And those of you who follow me probably know what flower it is. It's the cyclamine. This one has an overdose of cyclamine and it's so beautiful. It's something you smell out. And a lot of people are irritated by it because they don't know what it is. They can't pinpoint out what it is because they've never smelled the cyclamine. So they're irritated by this perfume. But when you know how cyclamine smells, then this one is just, it's love. It's just love, pure love. 
Oh my god. Oh, it smells so good. And it's also a bit peppery. Wait, let me clean up the top of the bottle and then let's close it. Okay. And it's a little bit peppery as well. It has it has a zesty character and uh it it's not shy at all. And mm, but it's quintessentially 90s. So, 1995. Now, moving on to number 5. Now, I I wanted to initially do Chanel number 5 as the fifth, but you know, very symbolic, but no. One of my favorite bottle designs of all times is uh, is the last one to be showcased. It's so special. Here it is, you guys. It is the pure perfume of Vivienne Westwood's Boudoir. In this gorgeous, gorgeous container. Uh, this one is super delicate, so I can't lay it flat when I'm opening it because otherwise the bottle is going to fall inside of the container. So we're going to lift the lid. You can see the orb on top. So we open up boudoir, and there it is, it's hiding inside of its boudoir, and you can see here, this is all flocked, by the way, it's the holder for the stopper, so when this thing is on, the bottle can't move around, but now the bottle isn't safe anymore, so it could, if I were to lay this flat, the bottle would fall into the back. So I'm going to hold it with my finger, and then you open up the container of boudoir, and you have the reflections of light on these silver and gold, because Westwood loves to mix silver and gold, and a lot of people are either silver or gold, but it's so beautiful to mix silver and gold. And this is the Pure Perfume Splash Bottle of a Boudoir. Ah, what can I say? It's just so beautiful. Now this is, again, a very, very uh, intelligent game of this was, by the way, when the distribution was still through Lancaster, not Coty. The Eau de Parfum uh, bottles that I use nowadays and that I'm also using for the review that is coming up. Stay tuned. It's going to be a, bl a blast, uh, the Boudoir review. But um, Lancaster produced the pure perfume. The liquid is a rosy liquid that with time turns ambery. This does not indicate that the perfume has gone bad. It actually... It, it's normal, especially with with boudoir, uh, even with the sprays, when you use them very, very soon, they they tend to oxidize in a way and turn brown. This is because of the ingredients inside. And yes, there are quite a few natural ones in there. So that is a good sign, actually, that it does change color with time. This one is still closed. I'm not going to open it. It is a stopper, this beautiful glass ball. It's a huge glass ball with a metal ring around it. And then all the crystals is a stopper. It's sealed inside of the bottle then you have to twist it take it off and then you free the liquid it even has its own little tassel with the orb on the on the metal almost re reminiscent of, of wax but it's not this is metal and it's the future of um, nobility in a way because what vivian did here uh, first of all you know there were some legal issues with uh Harris Tweed, because they used to use the symbol of the crown. Now they've made peace and they actually collaborate. Vivian Westwood does have some amazing Harris Tweed pieces designed with Harris Tweed or made with Harris Tweed materials designed by her or, and her uh, creative team. Um, but it was kind of a bit of a scandal back then to use it. And of course, it's also the Queen's Crown, but it's a three-dimensional orb projected into the future. And one of Vivian's collections where this uh, first uh, appeared, uh, it was supposed to depict the future of aristocracy. And it was a bubbly pop type of future. It was very, very fascinating. So also to see a perfume bottle blending those elements, the quintessential Vivian Westwood elements, and you know, also taking these kind of classic old school tassels from old school perfumery, but blending them with a concept of what will come in the future is what makes this bottle so important because it, it, it understands the past where, you know, the generations that are past or the um, decades or the epochs that have passed, it takes them in consideration very cleverly and then wraps it around in a bottle that could come from the future. That was the idea. And, and then name it boudoir, so something very sensual and sexual, so something that is noble and aristocratic, that it's supposed to, per bon ton, be uh, the opposite of talking openly about certain sexualities. This one does... This one unites all the extremities, all the opposites, 
unites them all, place them into one fragrance, to one bottle, and that is the boudoir bottle. It's the past, it's the future, it's the prude, it's the vulgar, it's the elegant, again, it's the tacky, it's the intelligent, and it's also the naive. Never stupid though, never dull, but it can be naive. You know how sexy naivete can be. If somebody's authentically pure of heart, they have a certain naivety, no matter how intelligent they are, and that naivety can be so attractive. And that's this bottle. It, it is, it's, it's shrewd and naive at the same time. And it's so, so gorgeous. So this was number five. And those were my top five perfume bottles of all time, really, the designs in splash form, because I cannot stress enough how much I want to preserve the art of perfume bottles and perfuming and pure perfumes and um, dabbers and stoppers, what do you, what, however you want to call them. This would be the selection. How do we put this one here, maybe? There you go. So... If you've liked this video, please do thumb it up. I don't know if I can lay this flat for now. They're all going to leak. This is so dangerous. <laughs> anyway, just quickly showcasing all of them like that. Uh, thumb up this video if you liked it. If you have, be sure to subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Super Jacob, all spelled together. I'm also on Patreon, and I would like to remind you that after this video is over on Patreon, um, this video will be longer for Patreon. It will continue with the secret bottle, with the secret sixth bottle. And uh, until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching. I love you all. Never forget to never give up on love. See you soon. Take care. Bye.